All right. Now, what else we're going to do today is talk about the PD Toolbox. All right. You're welcome. See, now, now this is going to be motivation for everybody next year. Oh, if I show up, I too can get a Starbucks card. Yeah. That was, this competition is tough. Oh. Was it two years ago? That's what I heard. Okay. I heard the cheesecake was good. I, I make good cheesecake. I also make a really good uh, chocolate Kahlua cake. Have you had that one yet? No, no one. Okay. No one. <laughs> okay, tell you what. Maybe I'll bring some to the bar. Beer and chocolate cake. I'm just saying the word goes on. Alright, yeah, remember, next Wednesday. About five will head to the bar. And depending on how many people we have, if we have around ten, we'll probably go to the big time. If we get more than that, we'll go to the college inn because it has bigger tables. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so maybe we should just do that. College inn is probably going to be. We'll reserve that. Do I have to call them up? Probably. Okay. All right. I'll try to call them up. Reserve it up. Okay. Now, the PDA toolbox. Now, on my screen, you will see I've started MATLAB. Now the only problem with uh, this student version of MATLAB, or no, sorry, this regular version of MATLAB is that I can't adjust the font sizes of the PD toolbox we're going to use. So I'm going to explain a lot and show you things, and then you're not going to be able to actually see them so well because the resolution isn't there. But all you have to do to get to the PD toolbox, you say PD tool. That's it. Press return, and up pops. The PD toolbox, which is basically this little uh, thing right here, the jig. I'm going to try to do this. Uh, and um, of course, you can't see this as well as sort of, you know, from where you are. But let me just do a, let's do a close up shot real quick up here. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. These top buttons. This is going to be important. So here's the important stuff. Here's going to be all the command line structures from here. You see these guys right here? All these are shapes. So you can make a square, elliptical thing, or, you know, ellipses in a certain case can be a circle. So you can make circles, ellipses. This little dealy here is lets you basically free draw anything. And also you can import shapes. So if you have a shape, you can import it. Okay? And so these first five buttons allow you, basically, you press on them. And you draw some shapes of your boundary, of your domain, whatever you want to do. Okay? This is the boundary condition. This is how you specify the boundary condition. If you click on that button, up will pop a menu, which allows you to specify the type of boundary condition you want to impose on, uh, on, your, on your domain that you've just basically created with here. So the idea in solving the problem is you go across this way. Okay? All right. Then, once you specify your boundary, you specify the PDE you're solving. And there's four different ones. Okay? Uh, and we'll, we'll go through that. Then this triangle meshes it. This triangle here meshes it better. It's kind of like basically an improved resolution. So when you press this button originally, it triangulates the region, creates the... I don't know what you call it. It creates the, the, the triangulation of the domain. This one here, if you press that, it makes it better and zooms in on it. Um, equal sign solves it. And then this plots it, and then this zooms in and so forth. Now, the interesting thing here is that all these buttons here basically stand right above here. So draw, the draw option, draw mode, Rectangles, rectangle, square, ellipse, ellipse, polygon. Those buttons that you push from the draw are those five buttons right there. So you can get to it either through pushing these buttons or just going up to the draw. Boundary is equivalent to this boundary symbol. You push on that and you specify boundaries. PDE is equivalent to the PDE. It's kind of, kind of funny that it's, there's a lot of redundancy in these buttons, but so be it. Mesh meshes it. And there's two mesh buttons here, but when you press the mesh button, you can initialize mesh, refine mesh, and then you can jiggle. Get jiggle with it. You know, Will Smith wrote that cool song, Get Jiggy With It. I'm thinking he, because he was an, a math major and he did MATLAB. 
and he, he, he basically ripped it off. He couldn't use Jiggle in the song because it's probably trademarked, but Jiggy, he could. Okay. And then he actually sounds better. It kind of rhymes better with what he was singing. Uh, solve, plot, there you go. All right. So those are the buttons we're going to be playing with. Um, so now we can zoom back out a little bit into the screen. We'll put this right like that. And now we're going to start playing around with this thing. So let's make up a computational domain we want to solve this on. And by the way, this domain down here, you can see that the axis, the default axis goes from negative 1 to 1, and then here goes negative 1.5 to 1.5. And you can go up there and just reset these to whatever size you want. But it will just work with the default for now. Okay? So what you would do is you push one of these buttons up here. And it's kind of funny because I'm laying the screen flat so I can barely see it. Here we go. And there we go. Push this. And I push the ellipse. Look at this. I can draw a big old ellipse. There's my domain. Part of it. I can make up whatever domain I want. So here I'm going to do another, uh, I'm going to do a box now. You can center a box, and I'm going to push, attach it down here. So there's my domain so far. So uh, interestingly enough, if you were to try to do a domain like this, which is the composition of these two structures, you can't write in, in, in with, with Fourier transform methods, because certainly these, the, it's assuming you're working on some nice periodic rectangular domains. Uh, and if you're doing finite difference around this, finite difference is very difficult too because you have all this structure you've got to capture and get very highly resolved around there. Now in addition to this domain, I might want to put some other structures in it. Like for instance, oh, oh shoot, okay. Uh, edit, undo that one. Hmm. Okay, I cleared it. There we go. Let me try this again. I can't remember if you do... Uh, okay. Sorry. There is an easier way. I haven't used this in a long time. I was playing around with it this morning, but I didn't play around with the polygon. There! There's a region. Suppose that's a something in there that's doing something. And one of the things is now I have these three different do domains. The interesting thing about what I can do with this is I can specify different properties for each one of these domains. In other words, I could say that the properties in the rectangle are different from the properties in this thing, different from the properties in the ellipse. Now, if you look up here, right here, can you guys see that a little bit right there? What it says is E1 plus R1 plus P1. Yeah. So the domains I have is E1 is the ellipse, right? R1 is this rectangle, and P1 is the uh, polygon. So right now my domain is made up of the three of them added together. So when I go back up there, I can also say, how about I'll make the domain of E1 plus R1 minus P1. In other words, I want to subtract out of my domain that polygon region, that this whole area in there. So you do that, return. OK, there we go. So there's our domain. Now, what I want to do, say, OK, now that I have that, and you can say, OK, so uh, go to the boundary. Oops, uh, no, TV, no. First, let's mesh it to see what this thing looks like. There. It's making a mesh. Boom. So somehow I didn't subtract out that polygon region. And again, I just did this earlier this morning, so I'm not exactly sure why. Okay, so we go back. I press one of these buttons. Let me see. Why is this not subtracting out? Minus P1. 
And then we should be able to go to... No. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the boundary regions. Boundary mode. We'll play around with this. I'm not an expert in this because I don't use it as much as any of the other tools I use, but... And I played with it this morning and it worked fine. But it's always, you know, the technical difficulties during class. So boundary mode, specify boundary conditions. And up pops this menu here. And here's what it says. Boundary condition equations. Look at the condition type, Neumann or Dirichlet. In other words, right now it's set to Dirichlet, which means boundaries are in the form H times U, which is the solution, is equal to R. You get to specify H, you get to specify R. In other words, on any boundary, you get to specify H of X, Y times U. Okay? So you have some complicated domain. So across any segment of the domain, I can specify that there. Okay? I can also specify something else, which is if I go over here and click on Neumann, it changes it. Do you see what it changes here? Now it says it's uh, N times C times grad U. So it's plus QU is equal to G, where C, Q, and G are just some functions. This thing is dotted into the normal. So what it does is it takes the normal derivative. In other words, it's taking some kind of normal condition flux across the boundary. And it already knows how to find the normal derivative across there. So all you've got to do is specify what C, Q, and G are. Very generic boundaries. I mean, linear boundary conditions. And you can specify either one, and you can specify it on any segment of this thing. Okay? Now, how do you do that? Well, let's quit this out for a second. And we'll go to what's called, we go to boundary and see boundary mode. And in boundary mode, I don't know if you can see this as well, but you see these red lines around here? So this is, you can't tell that it's red, but I can. Uh, right around here, this circle, down here, down here, and back and around, all red lines. So I can click on any one of these segments and specify boundary conditions on that segment. So for instance, I can click right there. Double click it, pops this up. And I can say, on that boundary, how about if we specify that, in fact, it satisfies a Dirichlet condition. Right now, the thing is that H is 1 and R is 0. Well, I don't know. Let's just make R is 1. Who cares? Let's make something up. OK. That boundary is specified. How about this boundary over here? Double click it. On that one, we have Neumann. And right now, H is 1, R is Q is 0, G is 0, and well, we can make something. How about Q is sine X? And how about G is, I don't know, X squared? Okay. You can make very general boundary conditions. You go around this thing, and what's interesting, you can't see it. I can. <laughs> How many times do I say that in this lecture? This now is a blue line. This is a red line. The red lines mean Dirichlet boundary conditions. The blue lines mean Neumann. So as you go through this, and you can go and basically change all the boundaries around as you wish, the default is that it's a so when we started this, when I just said boundary mode, it created this whole thing, all of it red. So it means the default is that it creates a boundary condition of the Dirichlet type with h equal 1, r equals 0. In other words, what it does, the default is that u equals 0 on the boundary. Okay? That's just, just the default if you don't do anything with it. So what we've just done is we've overwritten two of the boundary conditions with something else where one of them we said R is 1 and one of them we put something in here. And there's our domain. And I want to get rid of this thing. What's going on with this thing? I think it's the way I made the polygon that was a problem. 
because then I was connecting dots. I, some, I have to figure out which one to work, the right button. I mean, some, I think maybe I needed to push the right button to quit it. And then when I was all the way done, do the left button. Anyway, something like that. But let's just work with this example for a moment. I've specified some boundaries. Now I can specify, go up to the PD button. And when I push the PD button, here's what comes up. I have four different types of PDs I can solve. I can solve an elliptic problem, parabolic problem, hyperbolic, and the eigenmodes. So I can solve an eigenvalue problem. The eigenvalue problem is interesting because you could think of this thing as a, a drum. And if you want to look at the vibration modes of this drum, well, you do an eigenvalue problem. Hyperbolic problem is waves propagating across this thing. Parabolic problem is a diffusion equation process. Elliptic problem is sort of a steady state minimizing some kind of potential type issue. And here's the different equations. The elliptic problem solves the following. Let me write it down. Right, something like that, plus pretty general problem. You can specify C, A, and F. Give me anything you want in X and Y. Press go, it will solve that for you. Okay? So that's one type of problem. That's the elliptic solve. So already, that's a pretty large class of problems. It's a lot of problems that you get out of uh, high, you know, electrode statics. If you're looking at E and M theory, most of it's all going to fit right in there. It's all linear theory. You just have some complicated domains and complicated functions here. Big deal. Boom. You got them all solved right there with that thing. Okay? Another type of problem parabolic. It's the same equation as this, but now you just say, uh, UT <coughs> So now it's heat equations, UT equals plus is equal to this stuff. Okay, so now you're watching how this thing evolves in time. Hyperbolic problem. You get that? And then finally, the eigenvalue problem. So those are the four general types of problems you can solve. So my comments a little bit about software packages. They are awesome if your problem fits the format. If you have a problem of this form, PD Toolbox, fantastic. FemLab, same thing, except FemLab is actually, FemLab is a takeoff of this 10 years more advanced. So what have they done? Well, maybe we've built a couple more prototype cases. Suppose we have a bunch of examples set up for different applications. Okay? So part of the deal is if you come up with a brand new problem that doesn't fit into the form, you've either got to find a way to fit it into the form or write your own code. God forbid. Okay? But those are the types of problems you can have. Pass them around. All right. So this is what we can specify here. So for this here, let's do, for instance, just the elliptic problem for right now, which is right here. We're going to just solve this. So we're looking for one solution that solves this elliptic problem. You say, okay, fine. And right now, the default is that C is 1 and F is 10. So the forcing is 10. So that's fine. Let's just take the default, unless somebody else has strong objections and wants to do something else. Yeah, Pierre, you have strong objections and want to do something else? Because if you have strong objections, you're going to have to talk to the master. <laughs> Come on, Pierre. I'll take you. <laughs> OK. I got my friends here, too, Pierre. Don't be messing with me. All right. You've got to take us all on. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. <laughs> Mr. Um, Champion. Um, yeah. What's that? Where's Britney Spears? She's here. She's still here. Uh, She's still here. So is Keanu. So if I need any more help, I'll take you. Go ahead and ask your question now. 
<laughs> Mr. Frenchman. R C A N F. Uh -huh. function of X and Y. Is that an okay question, guys? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> they can be whatever you want. Yeah, so you can make them a function. C, A, and F can all be functions. Uh, you specify what you want. So this is the nice thing. It does the non-constant coefficient case, which is a really nice thing to do. Okay? And a hard thing to do analytically. So here's the deal. When you do something like this, the nice thing about this formulation is, oftentimes when you taught these methods for analytic methods, because these are all linear, I mean, on some level, I can solve all these by hand. But when you start making pretty complicated functions A and F and C, it becomes much harder to do an analytic solution technique for this thing. And in fact, that's, that's actually what typically makes it difficult to do uh, this analytically is because of these A and F, A, C, and F. OK. All right, so we're going to take the default case. Now what we're going to do, we specified our PD. Now we're going to mesh it. We've meshed it. Now we're going to say, okay, suppose I don't like this resolution. Well, what you can do is you can refine the mesh by pushing the triangles here. And look at that, a much nicer mesh. Now, normally when you refine it, um, it makes a pretty nice mesh. But then if you want to kind of smooth it out a little bit, oops, you jiggle it. And it makes it a little smoother. Will Smith would be proud. So there you go. There's our the domain, and all we have to do now is say solve. So solve PDE. Boom, go. Solves it. Uh, okay. An expression. It didn't like the x squared expression we had in there, so I'm going to go back and change that. I think we have to use an x dot squared or something like that. I mean, it's. Uh, so let's go back to. Um, was that in the boundary? Yeah. Boundary mode. I think it was this guy right here. Fine. You don't like that? Just make it one. OK. Go back through the process. Mesh it. Remesh it. And jiggle it. OK. Now we say solve, which is the equal button. Hope it doesn't complain. <laughs> there. <laughs> There's our solution. Kind of cool. So you see, what, Pierre? What are you going to ask now? No, uh, why is the mesh much finer in the middle? Is that because of the polygon? Yeah, exactly. but the why? The why? So whenever it has sharp corners in a domain, it tries to do more points near there. There's, the, uh, there's this underlying assumption that whenever you have changes in the boundary that are sharp, there would be dynamics there. And so it would do something like that. Uh, Okay, excellent. So anyway, that's your solution. And hey, Pierre. So like, um, I like French guys. Yeah, me too, dude. Okay. That's Brad Pitt. I got all the stars on today. Now, by the way, when we plot this thing, this is the generic thing. And by the way, over on the right of this thing is a color bar, which tells you how the height <coughs> and color are related. So here's a solution for, I mean, again, this is a non-trivial boundary condition with, I mean, sorry, non-trivial domain with a kind of a weird boundary condition over here where I put that sine x in it. Um, zero everywhere else, but just cranked out the solution just like that. Okay. Now there's some different options for plotting. So if you go out up to the plot window, uh, so parameters, plot solution. Oh no, where's the? There we go. Maybe that one. No. I'm looking for my parameters. Okay. Here we go. Here's when you just say parameters on the plot. What it pops up is the following. <coughs> pops up a thing. It says plot type. It says here color, contour, arrows, contour mesh. Let's do a contour mesh. In other words, you can do plot. Various different options. 
I have no idea what it just did. I think it's a three-dimensional picture, actually, that's, um, you're looking from the top, and you can see the heights here. Anyway, and you can't change the view angle, I don't think. So um, let's go back to some other ones. <laughs> How about arrows? Oh, that was a deformed mesh? Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to push that. How about arrows and color and a contour? We'll put all three of them on. Plot. So there, for instance, you see that? Little arrows, contours of constant amplitude solutions. So there's some things here you can do with this thing that are quite nice. Okay. The other thing, too, to see with this thing when you go to the plot with the parameters is that you can do, for instance, here has, you can do interpolated shading, flat shading. You can do um, some different kinds of, of properties here. You can say show mesh, color map. You can change the color map to some different ones. We'll change it to hot, for instance. Check this out. So you can say there's a hot color map. Quite a bit different than before. So there's some nice options for this. And then you can send this stuff out as export these as JPEGs or whatever files you need uh, to do. Um, what other pop properties do you have here? Contour plot levels. There's 20 contours in there right now. You can change it. Suppose that's too many for you. You don't like that. You can plot that and you can like go. Now it's going to be 10. There's now only 10 contours in there. So all this stuff be, can be customized to so how do you how you want to view this thing. Okay? Now the cool thing is, also with this thing, is when you look at the parameters, there's some settings here that doesn't really uh, matter for this one. But right down here, this button, which you can't use for this, it says animation. Animation is nice, right? Because now you can actually it doesn't count for this problem because right now we have a stagnant time independent problem. But when you do these things, you can do animations. You can say, how many slices of animation do you want? It'll, it'll actually tell you, like, I want to solve this from time 0 to time 100, and I want to take 30 slices. It's a lot like what you do with your code, and it will create an animation of, of the dynamics of these things as you go. Okay? So it's a nice option to have. All right. Um, we can also do a 3D plot. Let's do a 3D plot. A color. Okay. Plot. Let's see what happens. There's your 3D plot. Maybe. What's going on? You can't see it, but my screen is freaking out. Boom! Did you hear that? It crashed. All right. All right. PD tool. Huh. All right. Let's. Uh. I think. I think I can. Uh, I think I can just continue. I think what I have to do. Cancel and this here. It's not letting me. So what I have to do, I think, is uh, restart the computer here, or restart the MATLAB. Sorry. So it turns out, too, there was a lot of bugs in this uh, that I found, like especially with the plotting. Oh, you know what? I have to do a, what's the Control-Alt-Delete? How do you get the Control-Alt? Where's my delete? Clip MATLAB, yes, end task. Um, control Alt Delete. End task. End task. Yes, end task. <laughs> Obey me. Now. I crashed it pretty good. Control Alt Delete. All right. Let's see, don't try to do 3D plots. System is busy. If we can, um, yeah, I did a good number on this. We'll just restart the computer again. Oh, oh, delete again. 
Okay, so anyway, while it's coming back up, a um, couple more things to talk about. So, or let's come back to this here because I want to actually talk about a specific example that's in the notes uh, or talk about a specific problem we want to consider. Airflow over a, a wing or kind of some kind of structure. Now, we never got to this. Somehow, this quarter, we, I got shortchanged two lectures, I think. I usually have two more lectures. Like, if I teach this in the fall, because of the holiday schedule and because the fall quarter right ends on a Thursday and it starts on a... Anyway, there's like two extra lectures somehow in the fall. And one of the things I talk about is the following problem. Setting up a problem that we talked about in class, which is, suppose I put a wing or something like that here. Yeah, it's got cool noises. I put it on the jungle sounds. So, okay. Suppose I have something like this. And I want to investigate steady state flow over an airfoil. Something like this, which might be of interest to, to you. Or maybe not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the interesting thing about this problem is that it's a lot like our fluid problems for advection diffusion in, in the following sense. Remember that we had written down these equations here. And these equations were the advection diffusion for shallow water waves. Okay, so in other words, a two-dimensional flow and for how the vorticity evolved in that two-dimensional flow. Well, now let's consider the opposite problem, which is to say, consider the big old jet L liner. And I can say, yeah. And I can say, okay, what if I consider the following plane? Not plane as in airplane, but plane as in Mac plane. That comes across here and let's has sort of has is dealing with this profile of the wing. Okay, so I'm taking a slice across here. And I could ask the following question. In some sense this is a two-dimensional domain here. And if if I assume that it's an infinitely long wing, which is obviously a good assumption, given my drawing, uh, you could imagine that in fact the flow, at least for some part of it, is independent of if you're on the wing here versus on the wing here and so forth. So since it reduces down to a two-dimensional flow. But what do you know about two-dimensional flows? They're approximated nicely by these set of equations. Now what we want to do is steady state flow. What does it mean to be steady state? I want to get this thing into a regime where it reaches steady state, no turbulence. Gener generically, if you crank up the Reynolds number on a plane like this, right, the flow comes across here and you get turbulent wakes being generated. But suppose I go to a regime where I have low Reynolds number. You probably wouldn't lift the plane off the ground, but you could still do some kind of studies of the aerodynamics where the flow is just a really nice flow over the wing like this. And I want to wait till it settles down. What does it mean for it to settle down? It means what I'm looking for is for when the, the Vorticity over time, let's, let's, let's ask what happens. For time goes to large, what happens in this set of equations here? What happens to the vorticity? Well, what you've done is numerical simulations on this. What you saw is, right, the vortices interact, they collide, do all this stuff. And most of you probably ran your simulations up to time 20, 30 sometimes, maybe 40. What happens to get larger and larger time? What does this diffusion term do? The diffusion term sucks out of the energy out of this thing. And in fact, as t goes to infinity, this thing ensures that omega goes to zero. Okay? Everybody agree with that? So, t goes to infinity, vorticity goes to zero. That's what I mean by steady state. You've basically gone far enough out that all the vorticity has settled out What's left over then? Omega goes to zero, and you still have then 
this equation to be satisfied. The stream function is equal to zero, or the Laplace in the stream function is equal to zero. Okay, fine. So what does that mean for what we want to do? So in this problem here, by the way, I have some step more notes on this. If you look in the notes, right, lecture A3, there's even some really cool pictures in there. If you look at the very last, it's an appendix, third note, third lecture in the appendix, I talk about this problem here. Um, this is what's left over. And then so in some sense, you're saying, I want to now solve this problem for the steady state flow, where basically I have the stream function, the function of the stream function is zero, zero, 0 everywhere. And then I have this wing in here. So not only have this boundary here, but then I have a wing in here. And so on some level, what do we think of as the flow? Well, the flow should somehow do this, 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 this. And the idea is I want to take the boundary far enough away from the wing. So if you're far enough away from the wing, what does the flow up here look like? The flow up there doesn't even really see the wing, right? Kind of, if you're far enough up, in some sense the flow is just like this and like this. Only this flow locally is getting disturbed. And then you have your flow coming in here and going out here completely parallel. So it's almost like the flow comes in steady, does something locally near the wing, comes out also completely parallel. That's kind of the idea of what you're looking for. Well, what do you know about the stream function? You know that the u component of velocity, the x component of velocity is, isn't that? Uh, <laughs> I'm going completely off the top of my head right now because I can't remember exactly. Is it decide? Yeah, OK. That's right. That's right. Because you get the switch. Yeah. Negative. Yeah. yeah. So let's say this is u field, v field. These are the velocity vectors. So in some sense, it's kind of nice. You can think about setting up this whole problem based upon this kind of idea, which you say, oh, wait a minute. So I have to satisfy this here. What do we know about the flows everywhere else? Well, on this boundary here, I want basically all the flow to be parallel this way. In other words, I don't want any v flow. So I want to say that v equals 0 there. In other words, v equals 0 means what? Psi the x. So in other words, I want psi the x to be 0 there. I'm solving for psi here. Same thing up there. So up here, I want that to be 0. What about over here? Over here, I want all the flow to be this way, so I don't want any flow in this direction. Well, if I don't want any flow in this direction, or if I want all the flow just to be here, in fact, I can specify the flow across here to be, so let's say my incoming flow is some u naught, my outgoing flow should be u naught as well, right? So that's my velocity. Then I can say, okay, cross here, then I want psi dy to be u naught, and over here I want, and actually this is positive. Um, typically we go with the normal direction. Remember this, remember in our boundary condition, it, it, it wants to know what the normal is. What's the normal in this way? That's the normal to that boundary. So really this is flowing opposite to the normal. <coughs> it's going to pick up a minus sign. So now we have boundary condition one, two, three, four. And on the wing itself, we want the velocity to be zero. In other words, remember, nice thing is, this thing already wants to look for the normal. And what does it say about here? We want basically the velocity to be zero on this wing. And it's a gradient flow, so we can specify that the gradient across this thing is zero. Right? That's kind of the thing what you're looking for. That will imply your u and v are going to be 0 across there. And then write dotted with the normal or whatever. Because right, your derivatives of psi are u and v. And so you want to say my derivatives times the normal is going to be 0. OK? And then everywhere else, it's this. So here, all of a sudden, you've kind of, in a sort of a simple manner, set up a way to analyze the f 
steady state flow over of some airfoil. Okay? Of course, the really interesting stuff comes when you actually increase the Reynolds number and you get a bunch of turbulent wakes out here and you try to figure out how can I make this turbulent wake as small as possible. And so you're trying to figure out how to design this wing to make the turbulent wake small. Here, it's kind of a baby step towards that, understanding you know what the lift and drag and all that crap would be. Okay. Oops. Can you put a beep in there, Will? Yeah. See, I think I've lost him. All right. Here we go. So let's pull up this MATLAB again. And hopefully, there we go. Bring it up. PD tool. Give it a second here. I'll pop it up. And while we do that, you can just have some eye candy for you there. There we go. We just have these little icons that just it should do this while while you wait for applications to open. There you go. Ding, ding. Instead of that little clock. This is much more better. This is much better. Okay, see now we got it going. All right, here we go. Pierre, you should totally give her your give her your number to her. I saw you have that cell phone. She totally wants that number. Yeah. Okay. All right. See? You just have to have that French accent. I know. Yeah, it's, it's it. It's all you need. Okay, so here we go. Let's build something like this. Here's my box. And I'm going to build now an airfoil in there. There. There's my wing. As I said, typically what you want to do is, um, you know, you can import a wing shape. I'm going to have an elliptical wing right now. That's probably not what you want. Uh, you want something different than that, but you can import that data file into here. It will draw over that surface. And if I go back up here and say, okay, R1 minus E1, then I can say, okay, boundary mode. There. Now, now I got it. See, now I have red lines everywhere. And let's just do a simple example right now, which is, right now what it says is everything's zero on these edges. And then all the boundary conditions on here. What I want is no flux across this wing, right? So I can go in here, and I think I can do a. I don't know if I have to do each. Um, okay, so there's a control. There's a way to get them all there. Now, so I got them all, and I'm going to impose Neumann boundary conditions which says uh, no flux across it, so that's it. All I have to do is, it's already set up to just basically do that. So I just say that. So look at that. Now my wing says that the gradient across their normal is zero. And uh, up here and down here, um, what I want is something, let's just leave it right next. We're going to run out of time. So let's go over to these boundaries over here. And these boundaries over here say that what I want is the derivative to be something, right? I want to flow across there. So I'm going to, again, plus Neumann on there. And on one side, I'm going to make it so that the flow across there is like, say, 10. OK. And over here, I want to push the flow across there, say it's Neumann again, and say it's uh, negative 10. OK. So let's suppose I just do that for right now for my domain. So then I can say, okay, there we go. Now let's talk about which PDE we're going to solve. Okay, PDE mode. And we're going to solve an ellipt elliptic problem. This is just elliptic with coefficients being, you know, 1 and right-hand side being 0. And in fact, that's the default. Actually, no. F is 10. I don't know why they put that there, but we want F to be 0. OK. There we go. There's my domain with my wing cut out of the center with some boundary conditions. Next thing to do, mesh it. Ooh, not very good resolution. Refine it. That's probably good enough. And remember, jiggle it. Jiggle it. OK. There we go. Jiggle it. 
So you can jiggle it. All right. Is this what she does for a living? She's a professional jiggler. She sings too, I think. Not positive. Okay, now you've got that all set up. you got your mesh, your domain. All you have to do is press equals. It will solve it for you. It's solving and it's solving. Boom. So I, I still probably needed to work on my domain stuff that we had here. But let's go ahead and use some of our plot options. Because remember, we kind of went through quickly and we didn't really actually put in the right things. Let's put in some arrows and some contours. Plot. This is what you get. But remember, we're plotting the stream function, not the velocity field. So you can plot the gradient of this, I think. Plot parameters. Um, oh. OK, let's go plot parameters. All right, let's plot. Um, Gradient. I think that's it. Plot. What's that? The gradient of the velocity. Uh, the gradient of the psi field is it's the u plus v, right? It would be gradient of the potential psi over v. Yeah. Well, so I have psi, and so I'm taking the gradient of it here. So it's taking the field. It's taking the gradient of it. That's what should be plotting. And the gradient of this field is, you know, it's u plus v in some sense. And so when you do that, of course, we have the wrong boundary conditions up top, but this is what you get. Let me do a different color map that actually works a little bit better. Color map. Um, hot again. So. So obviously I have to do something with the boundary conditions here. But look at the, the arrows over here. You see the arrows? I actually did it backwards. The arrows are kind of all flowing here and flowing this way. So it's kind of the right thing. I would have to change the boundary conditions here. Right now, the stuff is coming in, going out here, coming in here. And I've actually got to specify the upper and lower boundary condition. But it goes clearly nicely around this wing structure. And if I were to impose the right fields on the top and the bottom, you can actually then get sort of a flow over this thing. Okay? And so the nice thing is you can sort of start thinking about if you were to design some kind of different kinds of wings, you could kind of get the flow field above and below, gives you an idea of how to calculate lift and things like that. All right? So anyway, that's just a basic introduction to the toolbox. Um, like I said, if you have problems of this form, Almost all the commercial packages do these right here, these four categories with very generic boundary conditions. Some of the more advanced packages have specific applications in mind, built specifically for certain applications, like I think ANSYS is built specifically for geared towards AA applications, aeronautics applications. FemLab has actually, they actually have been very good about taking different areas of science and saying, let's build example code. So all you have to do, instead of building this from scratch, you just say, I want to solve for the electric field in, the semi, you know, in some capacitor. And you just press, OK, I want a capacitor. And it pops up everything. So you just have to do very little work, and it will just solve it for you from there. Okay? So these commercial packages are very powerful. Part of the problem is access. So if you have access it through your home department, it's great. But like FemLab, that's like a couple thousand bucks if you want to buy it. So it's, it's kind of a deterrent typically for people like me. Um, and we don't have a departmental site license for it. So, But if you have these, this is a really powerful way to go. Um, it's an alternative to what we've done. Remember, it's probably the slowest way you're going to solve these, but it will handle any boundary conditions. I mean, any domain and boundary conditions that we've been playing with. As long as you're kind of linear, really, it's going to do just fine for you. OK. Rock on, everybody, and let's uh, let's thank our guests once again for coming on the show. You know, they get their nice celebrity check, and then there's there's our our little people, strong men behind them. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, and then we'll be out of here. Uh, so you got homeworks due Wednesday, and I have office hours today from two to three thirty again. Also, office hours.
I'm going to open up Monday morning for you guys. Okay, so Monday morning from pretty much 8.30. I have a final at 12.30. So from 8.30 to about noon, you're welcome to come by. Uh, if you have questions on the homework, Tuesday I'll probably have some time as well. Uh, do kind of try to get them to me by Wednesday late afternoon so I can get them graded by Friday and, and so forth. Okay? Excellent.